We are broadcasting live with accountants, bookkeepers, and business owners. Let's see those guns. We're doing the hang on a Friday morning, 8 a.m. Pacific, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern, somewhere in between Mountain and Central. Thank you all for joining with us. We have a very, 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 very special program planned for you all today. We're going to be talking about fraud. It's a slippery slope. It has happened to people who never expected it to happen. It has happened by people we never expected it to happen by. Um, it's happened to me. Um, and I can't tell you, there have been a number of times over the years that I've been shocked when I found out that somebody had stolen from their boss or their client that I never in a million years would have expected them, you know, that person to be the one. You know, you're blown away. Long, long time employees of companies have stolen from their employers. And, and these are situations where their employers have been very good to them over the years. And so it, it makes you wonder, number one, what leads a person to do something like this? Number two, and probably more importantly, how can we prevent it? How can we do everything in our power to make sure that <clears throat> we've done as much as we can to prevent it from happening? And last week, this topic came up. We were talking about it in the Hangout. I was able to arrange for a very special guest to come and join us this week, um, who appears to have left us for the moment. Did we lose her? What happened to Jamie? Uh, don't forget to unmute if you're going to talk. I Send her another invite. Maybe she had computer problems. A lot of that going around this week. It's all right. We got a lot of stuff to say before she comes in, anyway. <laughs> that's that's true. But I want to make sure that she's in here because you know it does okay, tend yeah. to fill up. So let's try this, Jamie. Back where, there she is. There she okay. Comes. Meanwhile. Um, Doug, I know you've had a lot of experience, we, and, and, and when we talked about this last week, we talked about Bill.com as definitely a very powerful tool, uh, which, among other things, can very significantly serve to, to accomplish what I'm talking about in terms of being able to put what Dennis was talking about with us a lot last week, the right internal controls in place, because trust in and of itself is a big weakness in internal controls. As yeah. much as we like to think that we work with people that we love and trust, and hopefully we do, that trust still in and of itself becomes a big weakness. As an auditor, I remember studying this, that if we see while we're at the client's location that there is perhaps more trust than there ought to be, that that could be a red flag, that that could be an indication that we should you know, be looking very carefully at whether or not this person has too much trust such that they might have too much opportunity and the temptation might be too great to, you know, quote unquote, borrow from the company. And that's, that's always how it gets skinned in my experiences. They start out, they just, they're just borrowing the money in their minds and they're going to replace it. And then, right. of course, what happens is nobody notices so they do it again, and then they do it again. Before you know it, they're in over their heads. Doug, you know, why don't you speak to us for a few minutes about your experience with this? Well, yeah, thanks, Seth. The, the way I think about and talk to uh, practitioners about, uh, about fraud is basically it occurs, there's this triangle of opportunity to, to actually commit fraud uh, and motive somebody's going to be, for one reason or another, motivated to do it, and uh, third, a, a rationalization of, well, I can or should or, or whatever. So that's what we aim with all fraud and internal control to, to limit is A, the opportunity, B, the motive, and C, the rationalization of, well, I can do it and, I, and it, it, you know, they owe me anyway kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's uh, and and what we're going to ask the Bill.com people to come in and talk about specifically how Bill.com addresses this. Uh, and Bill.com is the best tool I know for cash management to eliminate the opportunity for fraud because with Bill.com, you're taking everything paperless, you're taking it all to the cloud. You're, you're uh, putting levels of security at every step in the way of either paying money or receiving money. So you're never going to have paper checks anymore. You're never going to have 
uh, running to the bank to deposit checks, you know, for a while we're all going to still have uh, customers paying us with checks, but that's what we seek to eliminate as well. So, anyway, it's a tri just think of a triangle of fraud: opportunity, motive, and justification or, or rationalization of the of the uh, intent or of the. Uh, it's it's okay. I got I, they they deserve me to steal from them, which just baffles my mind that somebody could get there. But anyway, so we have Jamie Blackburn from uh, from Bill.com, and you're back. It's good to see that you're back, Jamie. Uh, so uh, tell us how you see this whole fraud thing, and maybe take us through a little bit of the product where we can uh, eliminate uh, the opportunity for fraud. Sure. I'd, I'd love to ask really quick how much time I have, and because there's a lot I can show you with Bill.com. Six oh, hours. hours. Six yeah. hours? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> no, the uh, the show is over at uh, nine o'clock, so you okay. have you know the, the better part of an hour uh, okay. starting right now. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, what I'd like to do is um, I'll take you through a couple things, and um, as we go through this, if there's something regarding fraud that is a big concern for you and you want to talk about addressing that as well, we can definitely um, see if that's uh, something that we can also cover. So a few of the things that Doug just managed, uh, mentioned uh, was the uh, opportunity and then that um, basically the ability to go ahead and, and create a check people don't see it and you know you can change the vendor name again and and now you've just um, uh, absconded with some money so well, I'm going to show you how in bill.com you can actually set a few different security measures the first thing is really the division of duties uh, making sure that the people who have access to the bank account um, are only the people approved on that bank account they can only write um, uh, write and send money off of that account if they've been approved uh, and also some other things like uh, we're going to talk about the audit trail um, I'm also going to show you uh, the bank verification process that we have we have a positive pay security method on our uh, checks as well and all the checks out of bill.com are written off of bill.com's account so as soon as those uh, funds are withdrawn the uh, the checks that go out are actually uh, with our transit and routing number, so you know it also saves you uh, from check washing and those kind of uh, fraudulent activities if you're sending a check in the mail. Okay, so let me go ahead and screen share, and we'll get you started. And Jamie, while you're setting that up, um, what you're going to do as you go through, you know, let's let's uh, do a little back and forth. I'm going to be watching for questions and things, and and uh, so if you just be a little interactive with me because uh, sometimes there's stuff you're going to put in here that we'll want to tell Great. the audience about or answer okay okay yep. yeah. for those of you kids watching at home if you have a question feel free to post it on the Google Plus feed if you're watching on Google Plus if you're watching on YouTube you may want to come over to Google Plus but I will bring up the feed on my screen from YouTube as well. So post your comments there. And if you are on Google Plus, feel free to uh, add me to your circles and use the chat. Um, and I will do my best to respond to questions. And if if uh, you know if it helps, I and we have the space available, I'll invite you in to come on live with the panel and ask your questions. If I can possibly do that, I'll I'll do my best to accommodate everyone. Right. So um, taking a look here, can you see my screen, everyone? We sure can. Okay, so taking a look here, what I've done first off is I've logged into um, the accountant console. This is uh, something that you're uh, given as part of the accountant program with Bill.com. Uh, accountant bookkeepers and financial managers um, can access this console in order to get in. The nice thing about this from here, you're, as the accountant, you have access to create your own company. You can add the client's companies down, and then um, you can control the setup of that account. So you can really make sure that those uh, security features are in place. Uh, from here, you're going to go ahead and add a new account. Um, so I've got one added here, so let's go ahead and, and pop into that account. Uh, from the account, the first thing you're wanted, going to be able to do is really creating that division of duties. What we've done in Bill.com is we've created five standard user roles. So when you're adding your um, users to the account, you're going to go over here 
uh, to the gear icon and under overview you're going to go ahead and select users and you're going to add the new user that you want to want to provide access to. Now these five different user roles and you can see them down here we have administrator who has full access of everything and you would think the administrator with full access to everything could also pay bills. The nice thing about uh, the security level on payments within bill.com is even though as an administrator you have the ability to pay bills you can only pay if you've gone through the verification process on that bank account or someone who's gone through the verification process on the bank account and has already said yes we have access to move money from this account they have to nominate you as a user so this just says you could do it if you've been nominated as a user on the bank account so most of the time what accountants do um, and bookkeepers they don't want that responsibility of actually releasing the funds um, and so they'll actually have one of the client members be the payer, the actual person who moves the money. So with this division of duties in Bill.com, you can really um, segment work within the workflow and allow certain people to do things. The next one um, you can see here is the accountant. They have um, access for a few different topics, really managing things like the chart of accounts, the vendors, and being able to sync with the accounting system. We also have the payer role. That's the payer. That's the person who's going to go in and they're going to add the bank account to bill.com and they're going to do the very first uh, uh, verification process with the bank. We have several layers of, um, of security on the bank account and I'll show you that in a moment. The next uh, role we have is the approver. That's the one who says uh, verifies and um, says yes, you can pay these bills or you can also uh, manage and process vendor credits. And then we also have the clerk role. And the clerk is the one who adds the bills to bill.com. They can data enter the information in. They can also manage vendors so they can add new vendors and record payments. So one of the, th the things that we talked about, I know in last week's presentation, a few people were talking about being able to change the vendor name and then going back in after you've cut the check and make, making it back to your own name. Um, and that would basically be something that you've just given, you know, the, the keys uh, to the kitchen here, to the clerk, if they have that ability. So an I, another nice thing that in bill.com, you can create a custom role. So let me show you where you can do that too. So as you're creating users, if for example you don't want your clerk to be able to create a vendor or edit a vendor name, you can go in here to roles and you could select that clerk role. You can say, you know, I don't want them to be able to manage uh, the, the, the vendor names themselves. So you can go ahead and you can actually copy or clone this role and create it clerk without vendors and then what you can do is you can you know you can basically lock down this role and say I don't want them to be able to view or manage well they want to maybe view but not manage and change vendor names okay so there's a lot of access and control in here that you can really provide um, so that you can streamline this and make sure it fits for your clients and, um, and basically create that division of duties that you need um, segmented by role so people have different activities within that bill payment process that really helps you eliminate the opportunities for fraud okay so I'm just gonna go ahead and save this vendor role or this a uh, clerk without vendor role and now underneath my roles I have that as an option I can drop down and select that for a specific vendor or sorry for a specific clerk that I don't want to have that that ability in the system okay but with our five uh, default roles you actually have the security that you need um, really around that bank account so let's take a look at um, the next section that I want to talk about now how do I put this into play this workflow uh, what you can do uh, the next step so we just talked about the division of duties I'm gonna go any questions on the on the roles in bill.com okay um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk right. about and show you how you can implement this workflow. Actually, hang on just a sec there, uh, Jamie. On the roles, this is a critical piece of the elimination of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So that triangle we were talking about at the beginning, the opportunity is what we seek to eliminate uh, for people to commit fraud. So it, the role is like uh, important to really understand. If you click back in there, you had those columns. Oh yes. It was the users, I guess. 
and um, there. When you create a new, see those columns are everything. And just repeat for us the star, the a, a pay approved or or unapproved for that matter. The two stars. What what did you say about that? Yeah, so um, the pay approved bills via bill.com means if you have the workflow set up um, and you've basically implemented the workflow in bill.com, you require every bill or vendor credit to be approved by a second party. They've got to log in and approve. This is an additional user you've got to have in the system. When um, this these two people, the payer or the administrator, if they're going to pay approved bills, that means they're they're able to release funds from from the or uh, from the system. Now, there's two things about this particular uh, field, this permission that you're granting. Number one, this permission is only available to users if they have bank verification authority. So they've been verified and they've gone through this verification process to pay the bill through bill.com. Okay, so the people who go through this process, and I'm actually going to walk you through, I'll show you what this looks like. You actually add the bank account. One person adds the bank account to bill.com. You're entering in all the information from your check like you usually would in a standard system, bank account, routing number. You enter that in, but the system also wants to verify you are a human being. So it takes um, three steps. It asks you questions about who you are. So it verifies your name, it verifies your personal address, and then asks you three individual questions about the history of your life. Um, and this is from standard information you can find online. Uh, and it goes in, it verifies that you are who you say you are. And then the next step is it verifies with the bank account that the bank authorizes you as a user. So the way you have that is you can either do an online verification and it takes a look at your uh, your online login so you've got to have that online username and password to verify or you could also do um, a, a one day uh, bank draft so we will go ahead and um, withdraw uh, less than a dollar amount from the account and then as the bank user you can go in and you can see well how much money was moved out of the account and you can come back to bill.com and enter that test transaction amount in um, and that'll also say yes you have access to this account because you can see the bank statements and you see the money moved so there's two different ways that we verify you with the bank but those right. three ways to verify you cannot come through this and have access even though it says yes unless the person who added the bank account then nominates me I won't have access to that bank account okay so even, even like this clerk couldn't do it even as the administrator even uh, as the administrator exactly so, so initially the person who sets up uh, their bill.com system for the first time would be the administrator, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then that person could become a payer, but would have to go through those same steps, right? Right. They either have to go through those steps if they're the first person adding the bank account, or if their client wants to give them that access and they sign over the, you know, the controls and contracts and say, this is what you're going to be doing and I release these particular processes to my accountant or to my bookkeeper. Right they're then going to go in and they'll have to nominate you um, and I can show you where that is in the bank account you actually go in and nominate a user on that bank account so here's that bank account so on this so the only person right now on this bank account that has author authorization to move money is Christy Ross and mm -hmm. when she logs in there will be a green button that says nominate an additional user and since um since I don't have access, I can't, even though I'm an administrator on the account, I can't nominate an additional user to add to this bank account. Only Christy can. Okay? So that's another way that you can really control and provide that level of access on the bank account. Um, back to the overview, there's another uh, thing that you have to do uh, with the users. So number one, you have to be nominated on the account, but number two, if you set up workflow in our system and you say you require an approver on a bill the only amount that can be moved by the administrator and the payer is the dollar amount that the approver approved and said yes so even if there's a bill that's a thousand dollars to be paid if the approver says there's a five dollar limit I only want to release five hundred dollars um, on this one thousand dollar bill when you go to pay the administrator and the payer can only release five hundred dollars they can only release up to the amount of the approvers approved. Right. So there's a, an additional level of security there. 
Right. And in case it's not clear to folks, um, what's going to happen when someone pays via bill.com is there's actually going to be a transfer of the money out of this account that you just saw. She went in and she showed you that Bank of America thing. So whoever's authorized to pay, they click a button, you'll see it later, but to pay, which initiates a transfer of funds from that bank account into like an escrow account at bill.com. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that happens is the money goes into the bill.com account and then bill.com's system takes over to pay the vendor. And there's two possible ways it would pay. It would maybe they'll have to write a check and put it in the mail for you. We hope not, but that is one uh, option if your if your vendor won't accept an ACH transfer. Uh, the other way is ACH transfers, which again, that's what we really want to encourage because that's better fraud control through the whole process down the road. So go ahead, Jamie. Yeah, definitely. Um, another thing on that, when we do um, that process and we, we pull the funds, we're writing it off of um, Bill.com's account. One of the other features that we have is we have positive pay clearing. So we're letting the banks know based on the check number how much that check is released for so how much money that check can actually be taken to the bank and cashed for so you know that's another way to say you know only five hundred dollars can be withdrawn from this check so uh, you know it's just a, another way of really making it secure right and in, in case people haven't heard of that word positive pay it's something that any of us could get with our bank we could essentially every time we release checks we can send electronically a file to the bank it says check number amount, check number amount, check number amount, so that when our checks come to be presented, it uh, the bank will match up those two and only pay those that we told them that we released. However, that's an expensive thing that the bank will charge you to do, and what you're getting with Bill.com is is they have positive pay for all of the the uh, payments that they initiate. So uh, you're getting the benefit of positive pay, but you're not paying yourself for that for those fees, those banks. Exactly, fees. exactly. It's just a built-in feature that we offer you. So it's another one of the ways that we can help you with fraud without having to really increase that additional need for your, your uh, clients or, your, or you yourself. Um, so the next thing is workflow. So now that we have have, let's say we've got our employees added, uh, we want to go ahead and build out a workflow so that um, our clerk is going to go in and they're going to add the bills. It's going to then go to the approver. The approver is going to review and approve the dollar amount of that bill to be released. And then the payer can go ahead and log in and then schedule the payment. Uh, and then the accountant can log in and do the sync. Okay, so those are kind of the standard roles as people do. The clerk, the approver, the payer, then the accountant. So let's go ahead and take a look at, well, now I want to turn that on so that all my bills are required to have an approver. What we can do here underneath the overview is we can go ahead and set up um, underneath payables this approvals section. And we can just edit this and go ahead and tell the system what we would like to do is we're going to go ahead and set up approval. So down here where it says um, how you pay your bills, there's an option that says bills are routed for approval and are ready to be paid only when approved. Okay, so that's to turn on the workflow. If you don't turn on this workflow, the default is, especially for very small businesses where maybe the CEO is the clerk, is the payer, is the approver, is the accountant, so that one person's doing it all, uh, the default is this is turned off. So anytime you enter a bill, you can go ahead and pay the bill if you have that bank authority. Okay, so that's kind of the standard. So you want to come in here and turn it on if you're going to have that approver is kind of a mid-step within, uh, within your workflow. Okay, so we can go ahead and turn that on. Another nice thing is um, there's this option above that says, are changes allowed to a bill or vendor credit that's been approved? Okay, so if it's been approved, you want to lock it down. If you're going to lock down that information and you don't want it to be changed anymore, let's say you don't want the vendor name to be changed, you don't want the dollar amount to be changed, you don't want the, the chart of account, the split accounts that you have on the bottom, you've assigned all of this payments out, you don't want to... Um, allow changes, go ahead and select changes that are not allowed. And that means after the approver has looked at it, really you're giving the keys to the kingdom here on the approver. They're going to be the ones responsible 
for approving the bills, the amounts, and then you're locking what they've decided down. So now the only person who can go back in and make that change would be the approver, the person who released and said, yes, this is the right amount to pay. Okay. Another thing that you can do on this screen is decide who's going to be the default approver for all future bills. So you can go ahead and drop down here and you can find who's that particular person. So if I wanted everything to come to me, or in this case, um, let's see, yeah, it could come to me as the approver and then Christy could then log in and make the payment because she has um, bank authority. Okay, so you can do, um, you can select different users here. And you want to make sure it's the user who understands um, the split payment so they understand the, the accounts. You also want to verify that they can, I don't know if you guys can still hear me, my Google Plus just kind of hiccuped. We hear you just fine. We can hear you. Oh. You sound great. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so then you select who the default approver is, and you can say, are they going to approve all future bills or only the ones with no other approver assigned? So as the clerk is adding bills, if they forget to drop down and add me, we could say, only when the clerk forgets me. So bills without any approver, I'm going to come on. And maybe, you know, there's other people in our organization who are also going to approve bills. So you really can make some decisions here and, and, and choose your approvers, your approval settings. And just go ahead and save that. Okay. Now workflow is turned on. Another thing that we have, and this is a new feature that I absolutely adore. We've had so many requests um, over the last year to really see new policies, approval workflow policies that people leverage. Um, you have that down here at the bottom. I'm going to show you really quick a new policy. So for example, for bills, you could say, I need approvers that are different based on dollar amount. So I could say for bills greater than maybe, let's say, five, um, I actually have to have two approvers. Okay, so my first approver is going to be Jamie, but I also want an additional approver to come on board, and Jean is going to log in, and anything over 5,000, she has to also approve. Okay, so this has added a second layer of security than my standard one-person approval workflow. Okay, so you can come in here and add new policies, which is which is wonderful. Based on dollar amount, you can ask, also require multiple uh, approvers. So you have to have two approvers on this one, for example. And you can do that by bill or vendor credit. Okay. So the number of approvers and the does this imply the order of those two as well, or just the two people? Just the two people. Um, I believe you can move the order. Um, I think you can move the order not only here, like I could just remove and change here, but I could also um, change it in um, in the bill itself. So I could say number of approvers too, um, and I don't have to put mandatory. I could remove both of these and just say two people have to approve, and on the bill it'll ask who are the you know you need to have these two wow. approvers. So I could say you know it's it's based on department. Maybe for my training department, I'm going to have Seth approve and then Doug approve, and then for you know any bills that go out of my hmm, sales okay. department, maybe it's two other people. So that's why there's a both a number there and the names. Mm -hmm. uh, the names are optional. The number just implies two total people must approve. The optional names name those specific people that uh, um, approve all bills. Right, it but means these having, two are mandatory. Mm -hmm. Right, but yeah. if I didn't have any in the mandatory there, what you're saying is I could still have two, but then as I create the bill, it says, sorry, you got to tell me which two people on this bill, a bill by bill basis, right? Exactly. So now let me show you what that okay. looks like. Inside the inbox, <clears throat> if I were to get a document, so here's a, here's a document that came in, and I would go ahead and create a bill, so I'm going to uh, create a new bill. Okay, I thought you were... It's going to tell me... Okay. When I add in my wholesale florist and I add in the amount, let me go ahead and add $550. Let me give it an invoice number here. When I do this, um, the system's going to ask me, who is this? And if I don't, see it automatically assigned both Jamie right. and Julie. So it's going to, one, remember who I added last time, but it's also going to tell me if I were to remove these, It'll tell me you need to have an approver. 
because of the mount. So here's this new flow. It rule. says, here's my, my rule. Yeah. Bills of $5,000 $5, or more require at least two approvers. All right. So, so now I have just to pause, pause for a sec here, Jamie. Just everybody, just take a, a, a 30,000 foot look here. Just compare this to doing anything with paper. You, you can't even get close to this kind of security with anything paper based. Uh, let alone the automation of it. I mean, you, you completely put these things on autopilot, so you know that person is held responsible to be in the, you know, approval chain. So all of these things kind of, they, they work all together to reduce the, the opportunity uh, for fraud, which is what we're really seeking to, to kill here. Yeah, and the closest you can come, by the way, to this with that on paper is that, you know, you can set it up with your bank that your checks require two signatures. Yeah. in order for them to be paid. And I can tell you that I have seen cases, many of them, where the banks don't pay that careful attention. So oh, even cool. with only one out of the two signatures that are supposed to be required, the oh, yeah. checks are still cleared and paid. And if you go back to the bank and say, hey, what gives? They're going to say, oh, well, sorry. Yeah, no, because they've got these automated machines now that aren't even looking at the signatures on checks as they come through. So don't ever even count on paper signatures being secure or two, two, requiring two is just like a waste of time. <laughs> right. You're gonna stay and not only that, but I've actually seen situations with people that I know where they somebody fraudulently wrote checks out of their account, overdrew their account, and guess who the bank went after? They didn't care that they didn't follow any protocols that the person had put into place right. with the bank. All they cared is, we want our money. And not only that, they practically turned around and accused the person and said, you probably defrauded your own account. Yeah. And they had a, So they got guilty until proven innocent, basically, at that point. Yeah. And they were the ones who got ripped off. So I think the moral of that story is, don't plan on relying on the banks for anything. They're not your friend in the end. They're just a yeah. place to keep your money. Well, and it's uh, the, the, sort of the, the opposite or the other side of that is we as bank account holders are responsible to keep that secure. And so whatever happened to make our account go crazy and overdraw or whatever, it's our responsibility to prevent that from happening, which is what this kind of stuff does. Mm -hmm. So can I ask ahead, like a Jamie. really silly question? Back to you, Jamie. Okay, we've got a question here. Tina, go Tina, go ahead. It. Well, I can wait until later. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look here. The next step is um, after you've done the division of duties and you've introduced workflow, now you'll want to go ahead and um, leverage that audit trail. As you're going through this bill and you're adding bills and you're setting things up in the system, uh, we store every single stage of a document that comes through the process we have an audit trail on it. So let me show you um, what that looks like. Underneath payables, I can come in here and let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a current vendor. And I'm going to take a look at one of their bills. Okay, so I have an invoice here. Underneath the um, left hand side, there's a bill the details and you can go down to the audit trail on that bill. It tells me on the very first day when the bill was created, who in the organization created it, and what they changed. It tells me the prior field and then the, the new field amount. So if I take a look here, I can see that on March 15th, Christy actually changed the amount. She reduced it from 16725 to $10,000. Okay. Now, you know, maybe that's not the dollar amount of the bill. Well, if you take a look here, she actually changed it back again. So on 315, went back from 10,000 up to 16,725 again. So this amount has changed back and forth. And maybe there was a, some negotiation going on where maybe the, the client, um, the vendor was saying, okay, maybe we'll do a discount or we'll, we'll cut you some slack here or maybe she was going to do a split payment. She was only going to pay 10000 in the beginning and, and then decided to pay the full amount. But you can kind of actually see what she was doing through the history of the bill with this audit trail. Okay, and This is the bill audit trail. We actually have an audit trail on pretty much anything that you can create in bill.com. So this is the bill details audit trail. Let's go back uh, to the summary of the bill. 
The next thing you'd want to see is, well, we've added the bill in, you know, we uploaded this document. Well, what about the payment itself? You can actually come to the payment and you can do the audit trail of the payment. Okay, so if there was a, a, an actual release of funds, you could see, well, what, what was that, that payment audit trail? So let's go ahead to one of the payments. I'm going to go to a, a historical payment here so you can see a payment history. So underneath the payment, I can go to details and I can see audit trail. So who sent the payment? Um, on this particular bill, uh, 318, Christy created that payment and the system then moved the money. It scheduled it and then it paid the actual funds out on the 22nd. Okay, so you can actually see not only the bill detail but the payment detail. You can also see the document detail as well. So on that particular bill, if we go back to the payment, I can select on that invoice. Let's see here, I want to find my invoice. Oh, this one doesn't have any bills associated to it. Let me go ahead and find one with a, with a document. On the document itself as well, oops, I opened it. I want to see the document. Hang on. Let me show you here. Okay, I don't have any documents in my document right. repository. <laughs> so I'm going to show you what we do on our, our documents in the history. So any documents that we receive, um, let's do year to date we show who added the document. Um, if it was added by email, it shows us the email address, uh, it shows us the file information, when it was added, how many pages in the file size. And um, what if that it was means, uploaded, uh -huh. just, just to make sure that we get there, when you set up a bill.com account, you're going to have a dedicated email address uh, at bill.com uh, that your vendors can send uh, PDFs to or Excel documents or whatever they want to send that is, uh, uh, is your your invoice. You'll get a fax number too. Even a fax, well, and we want to discourage them from doing fax, but of course if they're really old world, okay, they'll get a fax number too. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so, so the point there was if we go back to uh, Jamie's screen, there's different ways on that. Yeah, go back to where that that showed how the bill got there. The I mean the document got there, right? Yes. So it'll show you on the left hand side added by. And <laughs> if it was uploaded, you can upload documents three different ways. So the vendors can fax, the vendors can email directly. You can email in if you get any electronic ones, uh, your client can email in or you can upload. So it'll show you if I uploaded, so here's a few uploaded documents directly from a desktop. So somebody got maybe the email in as attachment and they just went ahead and uh, just dragged and dropped it right into their account. Right. Or you can see the email that it came in from. Yeah, the drag and drop is huge. That's a fairly recent addition and I have to say it's just tremendous. Cause yes, I Show that I, real quick because that is yeah. kind of cool. I typically get a lot of documents scanned in at once and then I take the whole lot of them and drop them on there and I watch bill.com work for me. Yeah, so she's got it circled there. Just If you're over on your desktop in another window, you find a PDF file that's sitting in a folder. Just drag that PDF and drop it right onto there and it'll upload it. There she's going. Now, um, it's a, this is a question. I'm, I know the answer, but I'm asking for everyone else's sake. Um, Jamie, what are the file formats that are compatible with uh, other, anything other than a PDF that I can use as a file format to drop in here and enter as a bill? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you can uh, use Excel files, JPEGs, images, uh, PDFs, um, emails, e even an email itself. If a, a vendor sends you or sends your clients their uh, statements or bills via email, any HTML email will come in as a text file and you can go ahead and use that as to generate your bill. You just, e you just mouse over the email and select create a new bill and it'll store that record of that transaction as well. So. Um, yeah, really, really anything you want to add. Supporting documents like images, um, if you're working with someone, like vendor contracts, you know, you really use this as a full document management and store any, any content that you'd like in here. So, pretty nice. So, I, the question that I had um, for Jamie and 
probably Doug and Seth. Um, my clients are very frugal, and so they really want to have you know the gangbuster setup, but they kind of don't want to pay for it. So my question is, they want to be able to interface um, within QuickBooks, and I don't know how the app interfaces within QuickBooks, or if you have to go outside of QuickBooks to get to Bill.com. But one of the features I know in QuickBooks is you can set up you know um, different users to have different access um, to kind of achieve what it looks like build.com is allowing through their users and then integrate um, QuickBooks with the online bill pay which I think eliminates having your personal um, checking account information at the bottom so I'm trying to figure out a comparison between using QuickBooks desktop for this instance integrated with our online bill pay versus using build.com and how that synchronizes or integrates or however it works um, with QuickBooks. To yeah, you can. That's an excellent question and I think a thousand people have that question so let's go slowly through that Jamie. Okay, sure. Um, so yes, you can definitely use the, the QuickBooks process with their online bill pay. Um, that is a definite security option in order to do that. They also offer things like the positive pay ability because they do the payment mo money movement for you as well. So there's a lot of great security that they offer. Um, what this does with bill.com, we can sync with QuickBooks. So this really actually moves the users out of QuickBooks. So, so if you have specific clients who uh, maybe you don't want them in the chart of accounts, kind of messing around and having that ability within QuickBooks and you'd still like them to have or they still want to have the ability to move money, pay their bills, send their invoices out um, and get paid uh, from their customers in a system where there's there's some control they can't, they can't actually go into the QuickBooks file. If you want to kind of get their fingers out of, of QuickBooks, this is kind of a, a way you can help them facilitate that. They can still manage their accounts receivable, still manage their accounts payable, but they're no longer, you know, in all of those locations where maybe they could, you know, change your accounts or, or you know, make some journal entries and things that maybe now later on, you know, closing the quarter, you're going to have to look at it and try and figure out what it was that they did. So, um, well, but that would be handled through the, that. I'm sorry, Jamie. That would be handled through the QuickBooks permissions, though, wouldn't it, to keep their fingers out of what I don't want them in? Yeah, you could do that through QuickBooks permissions as well. So yeah, it's really you can't just be that specific in QuickBooks though. QuickBooks lets you assign access or non-access to certain general areas. You can't be specific at all about it unless you're in QuickBooks Enterprise. That's the only QuickBooks product that lets you be very specific. And in my experience, you you can't even do that because although I might even be able to get to a specific goal of preventing somebody from going into a specific area usually you're going to get into jail with that kind that that particular employee needs to do another part of their job that requires that access so you end up giving way more permissions than you really think you should give if they're if they're going to be doing anything in the bank accounts in quickbooks yeah i've had that experience too where we yeah. tried to there's one thing that's cool about enterprises i can say this person only has access to this bank account but none of the others but like you said then invariably it comes up where they're trying to do something that impacts one of the other bank accounts now i've got to give them the access yeah. just to give kind of a specific example yeah okay yeah. thanks kids and so one of the, the things that you can do is implement um, bill.com with QuickBooks and we'll sync the information in. We'll pull in all the work that you've done with QuickBooks so you don't have to do any data entry. Um, we'll pull in the vendors, we'll pull in the clients, we'll also pull in the chart of accounts and then as um, your teams and your payments process and as the client walks through this, um, all that information is then available to then upload into QuickBooks. So you can just go ahead and we call it sync. Um, and we have a, a sync uh, option. There's uh, two different sync options. There's one with a sync downloadable app that you go ahead and sync and you download that wherever your QuickBooks is located. Um, and you can sync through from desktop. But there's also an online, QuickBooks online sync, where you just come to come up here and you select sync now. And then um, on the sync option, you go ahead and just hit sync there. And that's QBO. This particular example account is connected to QuickBooks Online. Okay. And it'll tell you if anything's not matching. Because I know like QuickBooks wants to make sure if there's Verizon Wireless, it's got to be the same vendor. So it'll tell you if there's duplicates and that kind of thing. So you can go ahead and fix those uh, sync issues. But yeah, yeah. you can definitely but, upload but that information up, back. 
But backing up a little bit, uh, um, the uh, issue of going to from QuickBooks to online banking to initiate payments to vendors is something that we've always been able to do. Uh, the banks either charge for that or don't, even if that's totally free. We really haven't done that much to reduce fraud because like Seth and I were just talking about, we still have to give that person the ability to do that, but there's no approval cycle. And the approval cycle is part of the, well, one of the big key pieces of eliminating the opportunity for fraud. Uh, so with online banking inside of QuickBooks, whoever has access to get into QuickBooks can basically initiate payments without without impunity. Uh, whereas with bill.com, as soon as a, a document comes in, it gets created as, as a bill, it then has to go through that process if we set it up, and there's no way it gets paid until those things are satisfied. So, um, yeah, yeah so, so online banking is kind of good for mom and dad, you know, at home for paying our, our utility bill. Uh, but for businesses, we have processes. We have different people in the company who have to approve uh, bills and make sure we got the services and those sorts of things. And that, I think, is the key reason why this is, it's almost not even, you don't even want to see it in the same camp as online bill pay through QuickBooks. It's a totally different scenario, and it solves for what we're really trying to do, which is reduce fraud. Right, and again, just to bring up a very specific example, what I'm starting to implement with Bill.com now is, you know, I have bookkeepers that I bring in and send them out to my clients. I don't want my bookkeepers to have, I don't, first of all, I don't want my clients leaving my bookkeepers with signed checks. That's where I've seen firsthand where you can get into trouble. Um, so I don't ever want that happening. I don't ever want a client leaving one of my bookkeepers or even their own with sign checks. It should never happen, especially when we have technology like this, to, to make it so that we don't have to do that. So instead, what I'm setting up now um, is a process where, assuming it's my bookkeeper at the client, the bookkeeper will be able to enter the bills, but either the client will have to approve them before they can be paid, or, uh, or it'll go to me to actually make the payment. So the bookkeeper will enter, the client will approve, I will be the only one who actually, my, myself and the client of course too, who can actually trigger the payment to be made so that nobody, no bookkeeper in other words, will ever have direct access to the ability to make a payment out of the client's bank account. I'm cutting them off from the client's bank account to protect my clients because I do very thorough background checks. I spend $100 on each background check so they go very deep into the records and it's, it's, it gives you some assurance but it doesn't guarantee anything. Right. And like I was saying before we at the very beginning today, I have seen too many situations where you know somebody who you would have thought in a million years you would never expect to do something like this, quote unquote. Right. Uh, ends up doing something like this right. because you don't know what's going on in their personal life. We were talking last week um, about you know a, a shoe addiction that somebody might have. <laughs> we're kidding about that, but all kidding aside, you know any number of things can go on in a person's personal life that can trigger them to do things they wouldn't ordinarily do. A drug addiction. Dennis and I were talking about a little bit last week, right? or significant medical issues that are costing a lot of money for them. It's these things that, these kinds of things that I've seen that will take a person who might normally never do something like this and all of a sudden changes their way of thinking and turns them into a person who is all of a sudden capable of doing this. So, And, and we don't, you know, people are going to be people. What we can do is eliminate the opportunity and that's what this is about is just, uh, it's our responsibility to eliminate the opportunity. That beep beep, by the way, was me just sending an invoice via QuickBooks to Christie's memorable party. So refresh your screen there, Jamie, and uh, see the bill that I just saw. If I was just a vendor of theirs and just uh, uh, sent her a bill, there it is from the Sleater Group. Now that went into her files to be processed, meaning uh, th there's a queue there of, of, of uh, documents that came in. These are invoices that just arrived. And now she processes them. She's taking it over because there's an automatic bill entry uh, service that we're not going to use in this case. But go ahead, Jamie, you can take it from here. 
Yeah, so um, what I've done is uh, kind of that, that step that Seth was talking about. We have a, an additional system that does uh, data entry. We actually have a team of, of um, bookkeepers, if you will. They're people who key the information for you. Uh, they don't actually um, e enter any split transactions, but they'll go in and key things like your vendor, your invoice amount, the date due, the bill amount. Um, and then it comes and then it goes directly to your approver and follows that process. So in this particular account, I have to take over in the queue. I've got to take that file out of the queue or else the data entry team is going to key it for me. Um, so what I've done here, now I've got this bill. Um, I simply can mouse over the thumbnail to see a higher uh, detail or I can go ahead and select create a new bill. And it's going to give me the options to enter the bill details and I can move this screen any Anywhere around the invoice so I can see the details um, and I can just enter in the information so it's like um, you know just start entering in the vendor and if I already have the Sleater group as a, a vendor in this account uh, it'll pop up it'll automatically pull up that vendor from my QuickBooks sync when I downloaded the, the original vendor list so here I don't have them so I would just select add new and, and then I can do a quick add and that's that's because you're authorized Right. Uh -huh. I'm authorized to add vendors. Uh, right. I gave myself that access. So now, what would you do if you weren't authorized? If I wasn't authorized to have access to add vendors, um, what I would have to do is in my workflow and in the business, I would have to let them know. I would have to let my manager know or whoever is kind of my next uh, next level uh, person to say, you know, we need to add a new vendor and then they could do it. So I'd have to let either the accountant um, or the administrator uh, add a vendor because I don't have that access. Right. Yep. So there, I can go ahead. Uh huh. There was a question earlier uh, that's sort of related here, which is what does it do to sync with QuickBooks? And uh, maybe we could uh, quickly go through what gets synced. Um, so yeah, what what we sync through, um, we sync the vendors, any changes to vendors, the customers, any changes to your customers. Uh, we actually sync the bill information. Uh, so and when you create this bill, this de detailed data, uh, it has everything. It has the invoice number, um, payment terms, invoice date, due date, amount. And if you're going to do split transactions, yeah, it'll do all of this. So we've got account, amount, Department, which we call departments, are actually classes in QuickBooks. So if you're familiar with that language, it would sync to the classes. Uh, location, job, um, and this is actually for job costing. So it'll sync down to uh, the customer and the, the sub job. So if you have uh, a customer with multiple jobs, uh, we can get down to that job level. And then we also have your items. So if you wanted to do uh, really good uh, detailed with your with your items in and out, we can sh show you like how much it actually cost for that item when you bought it, and then you can tie it to the item when you sell it in your invoices later. Right. So if you and wanted that, to yeah, that's really huge play. for job costing. In fact, yeah. I use that feature quite a bit myself because what I do is, you know, I get a bill from my bookkeeper or a timesheet. And what I do is I have a, uh, a bookkeeping item. And so what happens is it's a two-sided item in QuickBooks. So, you know, assuming I wasn't using bill.com, I, I enter a bill when I receive it to the bookkeeper, but then that goes into a queue so I can bill that time right back to my client at the rate that I charge my client. I love the fact that now with bill.com, I'm able to use this items feature that Jamie's showing to accomplish the exact same thing because yeah. when I later sync to QuickBooks, it just dumps it in for me. And that's another thing you could never do, by the way, with online banking. Right. That's true. Some people are... Some people are probably saying, well, wait a minute, why am I entering bills up in the cloud? I could always have just entered the bill straight in QuickBooks. Why don't, why doesn't bill.com just take the bills that, that I go ahead and enter into QuickBooks because I'm more comfortable with that? So let's talk about that, Jamie, a little bit. Um, for entering bills into QuickBooks, so there are some things you can enter into QuickBooks and then it syncs over to bill.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you usually want to create one location where you're entering information in and the nice thing here with this inbox is all the vendors can send their information directly here. I don't know if you can give vendor access to QuickBooks so that all your vendors can upload all their information into QuickBooks directly, um, but I know you can do that here. You can have your vendors, they can actually just come in and uh, they can add you know, fax and email directly right. into your process. Right. Um, so in terms of a best practice, we want you to put all of your AP entry 
into the cloud with Quick with Bill.com and never enter a bill into QuickBooks again. And that's some behavior change in your bookkeeping staff. But it's for a an important set of reasons here, right? We can automate the process of putting the invoice, uh, the, the the documents that create the invoices or the bills into the cloud. We could use the Bill.com entry service, so they would enter all of the transactions for you, uh, for the bookkeeper. So you're getting closer to this zero entry concept that we want to get to. Uh, even that, even still, if if we have the data entry service doing it there's going to be a certain number of bills that you're going to have. You're going to need to add, like Seth was talking about, the job costing information. Only the business is going to know the context of some of these bills and how they should be coded. So you'll still be doing some of that, but we don't want to do it in QuickBooks anymore. We want, In fact, we want to get as many people in the system out of QuickBooks because that's an accounting system. We want them to do their job, which is either entering a bill or approving a bill or working on the business workflow as opposed to bookkeeping transaction entry. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and then that also kicks off your workflow. So yeah. by doing it within bill.com and, and saying our APA transactions, we're going to enter our bills in bill.com, that's allowing you to start with those fraud right. controls immediately. As soon as it comes in from the vendor, your first person who's looking at it has the roles and the responsibilities, the division of duties, the correct role that they're supposed to do and those um, those those uh, features, those specific um, level of access to be able to do that and then it goes straight to your approver. So, you know, that's that's another really big thing to really help you with eliminating fraud right off the bat. There was a few other things that I was uh, going to be able to show you here really quick, but I want to finish up that question of what goes into QuickBooks. Yeah. Um, not only does the bill go, but we look at every bill as um, as three separate transactions that get that get um, get synced into uh, QuickBooks. The first one is your bill. The next one is your payment. We'll actually sync in that payment as well. So let me go ahead and show you here. Um, oh, I want to show right, you. These some. come in as those real documents in QuickBooks: the bill transaction, the payment mm -hmm. transaction. Yep. That payment comes in, um, and then also the funds transfer. So when you're syncing, um, there's a, a basically the, the money movement where uh, we pull the funds and put that uh, money into the, the bill.com holding right. account. You can actually, um, we also sync that funds transfer amount as well. Yeah, um, go over to chart, chart of accounts uh, so we can kind of show them exactly. So you're going to create these clearing accounts, money in clearing, well bill.com will create that. So let's yep. talk about this clearing account because yeah, people are saying, well wait a minute, how do I reconcile my bank account? Exactly. We do uh, two things. We we um, include and we add two chart of accounts. They're bank accounts that you're going to see inside QuickBooks. One's a bill.com money in clearing for receivables and a bill.com money out clearing for payments, for payables. And basically what that does is it shows you uh, the funds transfer amount, the amount that bill.com actually took uh, to cover the bills and then um, you want to see those line by line of who you know where did all those bills go because we do one draft we do that one amount um, and so when you look at your bank you're only going to see one figure but you'll want to be able to see that detailed transaction of well where did all those payments go into which vendors you can go to the bill.com money out clearing account and you can see detail by detail which which accounts those are. So you right. want to create so, those two accounts and we sync that in for you. And, and so a nice little side benefit here for the bookkeeper at the firm. Now uh, all of the detailed bill payments uh, are in another, it's in this clearing account. Um, but the sum of all bills paid during a particular day will be one bank debit to the real bank account. So when you go at the end of the month to reconcile your bank account, if you have 50 checks a month that you used to write, so you'd have 50 things to clear in the check, check, check in the QuickBooks reconciliation. Now, if you take those 50 checks a month, and let's say you pay bills uh, once a week, uh, like uh, I guess four or uh, five checks a week or whatever, uh, you're really just going to have uh, those four hits to the bank account, the weekly totals. So your reconciliation goes from 50 down to 4. And this is like a huge uh, uh, step forward in terms of simplicity of your own bank reconciliation. 
Right, and just to be clear, the, the bill.com clearing account essentially self-reconciles because it zeroes out every time. That's right. They take the sum out, then they pay all the bills, and it should zero out. It may not be zero every day because maybe we've got some that have uh, been, uh, let's see, that, that, that have recorded payments, but the, the, the bank debit was the next day or something. So, uh, you know, but you can look in that account. You can see all the transactions coming in and going out, and they do zero out. Uh, yeah, and, and over time. I actually have a client who, because he likes to see for sure which bills are being paid, so I run a check register report on that bill.com money out clearing account, and it's it's so cool because you can see each payment individually listed there, and then the total coming out for the transfer out to bill.com. So yeah, sometimes there'll be a timing difference so that you will see a yeah. negative amount in that money out clearing, but that'll usually clear out within a day at the most. Right, and um, you could reconcile that account too, but what I would do is I'd just bring it up, bring reconcile, unless I see any problems, because there isn't really like this statement like we would get from the bank for that account. But unless, you know, you're going to just inspect the account, you're going to see zeros all the time. If you don't see zeros, you're gonna, your eye's going to go there. And then I'd click reconcile and select all and get it done, you know, so it does reconcile. Think about if you're a QuickBooks expert, you know about when you later someday want to condense the data file and reduce the amount of transactions in the file, well, you have to have these transactions reconciled in order for them to get deleted out, so you'll want to do that. So anyway, we're off uh, <laughs> off from where you're going, uh, Jamie. That's Go okay. Ahead. The last thing I wanted to, uh, to show you guys with fraud, um, really quick, another way that we um, help eliminate fraud, we talked about the bank verification. The only way to release funds is you've gone through that three-step process to be verified. We also offer that positive pay where we tell the bank, here's the check number, and we tell them how much money it's going to go out. So here's the check, you know, 79.29, and it's only good for $450. So we send that to the bank so they know how much to write the account the check for and it cannot be changed to a higher amount um, and then we also do check cleared imaging so you know you may right now get your 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 cleared images uh, from the bank in an electronic file and now you've got to go through and sort them and send them to the right places we do that all for you and it's right there um, on your payment so you can come in and actually see well who signed that check when was it cashed uh, that kind of information you can actually come in and take a look at it so it's just another uh, another um, a clear check image it offered offers kind of that additional fraud security okay, and we, we didn't get to do any accounts receivable fraud but if we were able to do this with accounts payable just imagine what we've done on the receivable side to help your customers ensure that their payments to you are also secure yeah maybe we'll, on another hangout we'll go for the receivable side of this but before you finish this screen right here uh, since we're really trying to go to ACH for everything show us what happens to prove payment via ACH. Yeah, so on a, a, paid, a payment that went through uh, ACH, let me go ahead and pull up one that uh, went through. Let's see if I've got one in this account. And while you're looking, did I miss it? Did you talk about the ePay? No, like inviting vendors, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, she didn't get there. I didn't We're get there. Doing this, uh, every, every week for like six weeks. Uh, <laughs> we probably there's, could. There's quite a lot. Here's an, another transaction. So we do e-payment. We also can do payments via PayPal. So when you do an e-payment, it actually shows you the payment information. On the right-hand side, it shows you the, pay, the date that the money moved, and it gives you a, the banking ID, basically the, the money movement ID. And for PayPal, it'll actually give you the transaction ID as well. So you can do payments three different ways, um, and we show you that information in your payment screen. So here's one. I didn't have one for e-payment on this account, but I do have one for PayPal here that I could show you. It looks kind of the same. It's that transaction information. So if somebody comes back and they're like, well, when, when did that transaction go, or I need proof that that transaction occurred, you can give that information to the bank, and they can pull up and find that the money movement for you, because that's when the money went into your vendor's account. Okay. So... Hmm. What's so, also really cool, by the way, is that when you, if you put the uh, vendor's email address in their profile, they'll get an email notification letting them know that you've paid them. I can't tell you. It's a subtle little thing, but it makes such a difference. The vendors love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every time I pay you, Seth, for, to, to keep quiet, you love it. 
<laughs> I do. I get. I love getting those emails saying. Whenever Guido comes, you you get this uh, silence of a uh, nice <laughs> little payment notification to Guido. <laughs> yep. You also have um, uncashed checks, return checks, failed e payments. So you get a list of anything that didn't go through, anything that was sent in the mail and it couldn't be delivered. Um, so you can always come in here and you can void that check and reissue it so you don't have anything outstanding. Um, but yeah, we've got a, quite, a, quite a few different um, gaps, or not stop gaps, but some solutions here for you for uh, eliminating fraud within your processes. Excellent. So and the have... customer support is amazing, by the way. I want to I want to give a little testimonial here. Um, that the customer support for Bill.com is just fantastic. Every time I've needed help, I've got the chat support, I've got the phone support. I I can leave a message and somebody will call me one way or another. I have always been able to get help with my problems and I've always been able to get them resolved within twenty four hours max, usually a lot less. So I'm just sharing my screen. You see this? No, you don't. I just wanted to show. Uh, I've got. I was just have it, had an example for you, uh, Jamie, of a payment. Do you see my screen? Yeah, you do. Here's a payment that I made via Bill.com via uh, ACH. I guess I'll put that. You see that? So it looked a lot like that uh, PayPal. There's a reference ID. Uh, the bank routing numbers, and I think these are my numbers. Are these my number, or are these the uh, the payee? That's the payee. I see. Your information's on the left. Their information's on the right. I see. So, so let's pretend down the road you have to prove that you paid it. Like you know, where's your canceled check? So, is this what we would do? Just come here and print this somehow, or? Um, if they, if you wanted to prove, provide proof of payment, you can use that reference ID. Yeah. And then they can use that with their bank to tra to locate the transaction. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, Doug, if you hit Control Plus on your on your keyboard, it'll enlarge the view of your screen, yeah. so it'll be a little easier to see. This here. There you go. Okay. Well. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Jamie. This has been just really good. You you do good demos. I love it. <laughs> I'm going to take you with me everywhere. Good <laughs> demo. <laughs> yep. Because I, I have I have been a Bill.com user for now four years. I use it every day. Really, literally. I'm I've I've got the I got the Bill.com phone <laughs> from my phone. Uh, it's kind of fun, but it's funny. Even though one uses it. It, there's still a lot of nuance to it that you, if you don't really touch it every day, you're gonna uh, continually learn more about it. I learned some new stuff today, like the uh, uh, in the uh, I'm trying to remember what you said in the uh, pr uh, policies, the policies for two approvers. I didn't realize that was there. So uh, there's always some new stuff that they're adding. New stuff we're adding. Value. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a couple amazing. questions on the on the group chat. Uh, some people were asking about their vendors. Yeah. Uh, do, do, does my vendor, for example, have to give their routing number and account number, um, or do we have to obtain that and enter it in? Uh, that's another nice thing about um, Bill.com security. We not only want to make it secure for you and your clients, we also make it secure for your vendors and your customers. So your vendors all get a free payment account, a Bill.com um, ability to go ahead and enter in their information. Basically what you do is send them an e-byte um, and then they can go ahead and create basically that that e-payment ability. Um, they enter in their their uh, their information to receive the payment. So you don't have to enter in the bank account. Um, it can be done for you. The other right. thing, um, your nice. customers can do that as well. So Yeah, so this invitation says to your, your vendors, this is a secure portal that you go to, Mr. Vendor, you put your name and address and, and uh, information and banking information in. I don't ever even see it, uh, but I my, my account receives the information that I'm connected to you, and so then I can pay you, but I don't know your bank account number or anything. So that's another thing. If it, Before a bill.com, if I wanted to ACH you, I'd have to say, please tell me your bank account and routing number. Well, nobody wants to give that information away. 
So they don't have to here. It's in their own secure, free portal to yep. get paid via bill.com. Yep, and you can invite them um, a couple ways. Underneath your vendor list, you just simply select set up e-payments, and you can find them electronically in our current directory. Uh, we've got a network that's currently um, connected to over over 4,000 uh, vendors uh, around the nation. A lot of the most common ones, uh, you know, phone companies, uh, utility companies, people that uh, are being paid often. Uh, you just simply select find matches and we'll search your entire vendor list against our list and help you find those matches. You just want to make sure you verify that address. You can also invite them via uh, email, which Doug was just talking about. You just go ahead and select invite and then you you know can choose them all and you can send them an email and have them you know all offer to uh, to enter their information and if they are someone like a vendor you're paying uh, maybe you're paying an employee for employee reimbursements uh, and you have that information on file you know you already have their check information you can manually you can still do that if you want to manually set up their e-payment information for like employee reimbursements um, but even then you can have your employee just invite them they can log in and and set up their own uh, their own information online so. yeah. good question all right, very good. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, here comes my shameless plug. In less than an hour, we have Explore, the scientific approach to setting your rates, going live at 10 o'clock. Uh, officially, the sales have ended, but if you want to get in at the last minute, send me an email to seth at nerdenterprises.com, and I will open it up and make sure that you're able to get in. If you sign up, you get the recording included, of course. So you will get the recording even if you can't actually attend live at 10 a.m. this morning. And Jamie, I just want to thank you so much again. Um, what I would actually like to have you do is come back um, maybe next week or the week after to show us the receivables part of this because I think it's compelling and I think it's important to see. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks Jamie. Great hangout today. Thanks. Thanks, All right, guys. thanks, guys. Thank you.